Good afternoon, Introduction to Religious Studies students. This is Share with you. And today I'm doing something I have never done before, which is a lecture interlaced with a recipe. Uh, and it's a recipe for this dish called dal, uh, which is very prominent in uh, places like South Asia. And I will be making this recipe for you. I'm thinking maybe I should just hold this like that in the meanwhile. There you go. Hey team, how's it going? Uh, maybe a little bit like, there it is. That's much better, okay. So the objective today is to synthesize the two readings we have had done until now for the course of the, over the course of the semester. And that being Alcon's and Aguayere's edition on food justice and then Secondly, we have Gretel van Vieren, uh, also on food justice. So as you know, this course is called Introduction to Religious Studies. The reason why we have two, two works we have, that we have read are both about food is because we want to learn what is religion through immersing ourselves in this ongoing debate about how do we secure food sovereignty or food security or food justice. Um, we can talk a little bit about the semantics of these three terms, sovereignty, justice, or security. I kind of like the notion of food sovereignty, uh, but for now, I'm just using these terms as synonymous to each other. Okay, so how does religion help us understand, uh, or how do we understand religion by examining this ongoing debate about food sovereignty? So with the Alcon work, if you recall, there wasn't that much about religion in that, in that work. Um, if you remember, I don't know if this is way too low. I think this might be a little way too low. Let me see how I could get it a little bit higher. Well, maybe I can get this thing out here. Let's see if this is better. I'm gonna try to find a nice frame uh, to get it. These are just a couple of bananas. Uh, ignore the bananas. I'm just trying to get myself better. Uh, Maybe like that, maybe like that, uh, that could be good. There it is, that's good. But now you can't see me cutting. So maybe like that, oh yeah, that's a good one. That's perfect, yeah, there you go. You don't need to see my face. So going back, Alcon, you don't really see much religion in Alcon's work, do you? Uh, the first time actually we do encounter a religious organization in that book is I think it's chapter seven or chapter eight, but it's in the latter part of the book where Alcon talks about, or the particular author of that chapter talks about the nation of Islam. And they argue that the nation of Islam seeks to uh, realize food sovereignty, that the movement is, has everything to do with food, which is something I absolutely agree with. Uh, and it's a great insight. But if you were to read the entire chapter, religion as we think about religion like ritual, ritual practices things people do you don't really see much of that um, what you learn about is the fact that the nation of islam has a farm that they own uh, somewhere in georgia outside the city of atlanta where the congregants where the followers uh, live atlanta and chicago being two of the most well-known cities uh, for followers of Nation of Islam, alongside various other cities like New York and Washington, D.C., Detroit, St. Louis, Chicago, etc. Uh, sorry, I already mentioned Chicago. Uh, Indianapolis being another one, I would say. Uh, Baltimore as well, uh, and Philadelphia. Cities in the Northeast and the Rust Belt, where the Nation of Islam uh, spread in the interwar years. Anyways, one of the odd things about uh, that chapter is that the author acknowledges that, you know, actually nobody really lives on those farms. Instead, the produce from the farm is distributed or transported back to Atlanta. And uh, this, 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 this fact kind of made me, you know, to me, it was an interesting bit. Like, you know, we're not talking about people on the farm. We're really just talking about the food grown on the farm. Uh, and for me, that distinction is important. And uh, 
but for the author, that distinction doesn't necessarily uh, weaken the overarching argument in both the chapter, but also across the book. And that overarching chap uh, argument being that when you look at food sovereignty, food sovereignty has everything to do with ownership of land. And that's basically the key insight from Alcon's work, right? That when you talk about food sovereignty, you have to think about do you have ownership of the food that you're producing or are you consuming food elsewhere? And Alcon argues, and this is a really key argument, this is an important argument to understand, which is that consumption, consumption as a model of food uh, uh, a distribution where you go to a grocery store and you buy something and you pay uh, something with your credit card or your cash or your debit card, that model is always going to be bereft of reaching food sovereignty. It, it, it makes you dependent upon products that are made of genetically modified animals. Uh, so even for instance, the almond milk or other kinds of organic milk produce that you will find being sold at an ex exorbitant price. Uh, we don't know this, but usually these milk products are, are made of, are, uh, you know, based on cows that are forced to produce a lot of milk um, against their will uh, by these you know, GMOs. They're made to basically secrete more and more milk uh, in order to produce more and more bottles of milk to be sold at the grocery store. And so one of the key insights of Alcon, this is an insight that can easily be uh, ignored or overlooked is that grocery stores, regardless of whether they're organic or not. So regardless of whether you're looking at Trader Joe's or you're looking at your dollar store or your uh, Safeway or your Giant or your uh, Salvation Army hybrid Safeway or whatever the grocery store you may be looking at, these stores overall collectively, they all are after at the end of the day making you purchase something that you did not produce on your own. And so you are not the producer of the food, you're a consumer of the food. And its effects are deleterious on your health because the food items, again, are infested with fertilizers, with pesticides, uh, and with these GMO products. Um, you know, one of the scariest things uh, that uh, is, it's one of those big truths that nobody uh, wants to talk about is uh, the, uh, the increased number of frequency of women in their mid 40s and early 50s being diagnosed with with all sorts of cancers including breast cancer and uh, when you look at uh, organizations or events that seek to promote breast cancer awareness they tend to uh, make uh, this particular illness rooted in genetics so they will talk about you have to get uh, you know checkups for your breast to see if you are uh, prone to getting breast cancer or if someone in your family had breast cancer, then you should get your breast checked up and things like that. Essentially, they turn it into a kind of a, a kind of a genetic defect that can, the quicker you can spot and detect, the, the better the chances you have of uh, preventing it from uh, happening to you. What nobody talks about, of course, is the fact that a lot of this breast cancer could very well in fact, there is enough data out there to suggest that it very much is caused by the milk uh, we drink. Uh, so think about it. I mean, GMO, you have a cow that's secreting milk. That cow is made to secrete more milk than the poor cow wants to secrete. Um, that cow has been genetically, genetically modified, all right? to be more than it is. So now think about it, like we think about cancer. What is cancer? What is the key feature of cancer cells? They are, they, they, they are they're more, uh, they make uh, your, your cells grow uh, at a rate that is not normal. Um, it's basically an excessive growth of cells, right? So you're drinking milk from an animal that is being made to excessively grow and to produce more and more milk. Why would you not get cancer? You know, that's a very basic explanation. But we don't necessarily uh, tie uh, our eating and our diet 
to uh, such illnesses because if we were to do so, then we would have to, uh, you know, have a different food system and it would require us to think about, you know, an organic uh, aluminum or not aluminum, sorry, an organic uh, uh, almond milk uh, bottle, for instance, very differently than we do think about it. So this is one of the key insights, right? You can easily misread Alcon for arguing that neighborhoods in the inner cities uh, in economically depressed areas lack access to a Trader Joe's or a Whole Food, and that is the sign of uh, lack of food sovereignty. Um, not necessarily. Alcon is making a far more damning critique of, uh, uh, than that. Her critique is not that we do not have access to organic grocery stores, and that is the reason why we don't have food justice. Her argument is that the organic grocery stores in the nicer neighborhood and the dollar stores and the giants and the subways in the not so nice neighborhood, all of them make you dependent on consuming food that you do not produce. And all of them sell food items that are infested with fertilizers, with bioagricultural chemicals, and with GMO animal products, especially the milk we drink. And therefore, all of them make you prone uh, to becoming ill. And that's a far more damning critique and a far more worrisome critique because it uh, effectively takes away the aspirations of having a Trader Joe's closer by or a Whole Foods nearer to you. And it forces you to kind of approach these organic grocery stores differently and to think about what is it that these grocery stores do which uh, create this uh, illusion of health. Uh, what exactly is it about them that makes us feel that these places are somehow healthier than uh, the dollar store across the street from the McDonald's where you can get a pound cake for $1.50 and candy bars for 80 cents, et cetera. What exactly is it about these stores that makes you feel at least that you're, um, you are surrounded by health and, and organic and natural and not with pesticides and fertilizers and genetically modified uh, cow milk? And we'll get back to that uh, question at the end of this little uh, lecture that I'm doing right now. Anyways, going back to the question of what is religion? Well, in Alcon, religion is that farmland that a religious community has ownership of. Effectively, it's a pretty scant analysis of religion, right? There's not that much happening with religion. We do not learn a lot about religion, but within those limitations in Alcon, you should start to think about what religion potentially then is, right? Alcon is limited in, uh, in giving us a robust understanding of religion, but in its limitations, it hints at what is exactly it is that we're missing out on when we think about religion. The key thing we miss out on in the Alcon work with regards to religion is the body. Because Alcon's edition is, uh, and Alcon's understanding of food justice is hinges so heavily upon ownership of land, space, this particular land, this, 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 uh, this imagined farmland takes on a particular valence, a particular, uh, uh, a kind of a necessity, a kind of importance which uh, extends beyond the people who inhabit the land. It almost feels like, you know, the human element doesn't necessarily even uh, matters as much as the land element does. And we kind of see that in the chapter on Nation of Islam, right? Again, uh, to, to go back to that point, the farm that the Nation of Islam owns is not the site where the followers of the Nation of Islam live. Uh, the farm grows the produce that the followers will intake once the produce are transported back to Atlanta, right? But we don't necessarily gain insights into how the followers of the Nation of Islam engage with the food that they eat on the land in which the food grows. The followers are in Atlanta, the farm is somewhere else in Georgia, and that, that 
captures the argument that doesn't dilute the argument because the argument is all about you need to have ownership of of a large plot of farmlands on which you can make your food how do you make your food what does the land do to you how do you experience the land those kinds of questions are omitted because that particular land is ultimately what matters right it is ultimately the factor that determines whether you are sovereign or you are dependent on other kinds of uh, entities for your food. So the massive strength of the work is its robust critique of the going organic movement, right? The massive strength is that it reveals that the organic movement is no more healthier than your other grocery stores because it reproduces and sustains a consumptive model of food distribution. And as a consequence, it has as much uh, items that are not good for your health because you do not know where this stuff is being made. It's made somewhere else and it's full of pesticides and GMOs. That is the key insight of the work. So do not idealize the Trader Joe's or the Whole Foods. Do not, um, your source of anger about lack of food justice shouldn't be that your neighborhood is far away from Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. That is what Alcon is implying with that argument. And it would be a misreading of the argument to assume that Alcon wants you to build your own Trader Joe's in your neighborhood, but rather Alcon is saying, damn the Trader Joe's, damn the Whole Foods. Uh, they're no different than the grocery stores nearby you. The weakness of course, is that the prescription is a large plot of land which you own and it's reminiscent of a kind of quintessential farmland um, that you can kind of imagine by yourself, uh, horses, buggies, um, hay, uh, you know, uh, some hay, some, uh, some cows, uh, grazing on, on a pastured land that you own. And it might be hard for you to imagine all of that because uh, you are probably not a landowner, uh, a rancher who owns his or her land. Most of us are not, very few of us in fact are in places like even Iowa and Indiana, Ken Kansas and uh, other uh, areas that are considered the heartland of United States. Places that you can kind of quintessentially think about white farmers sitting on in their, uh, in their big uh, tractors, uh, John Deere tractors. Uh, they in fact uh, share misery uh, that is quite similar to the miseries that you share. Uh, most of them are uh, growing uh, uh, corn and uh, corn that, uh, that ends up being in your car. Uh, it fuels your car. They're not growing things that they're actually eating. And the reason for that is because the seeds that they're growing is also seeds that they do not have ownership over. Instead, uh, companies uh, uh, such as, and I'm forgetting the name of this particular company. Uh, what is it called? I'm totally forgetting the name of this one particular company. Anyways, there are some corporate corporations that actually own the seeds. And these corporations determine how those seeds are grown and what those seeds are gonna be used for. So the scenario we face in cities is actually very similar to the scenarios that farmers are facing in like Waterloo, Indiana, for instance. Um, they don't actually have access to food that they grow. The food that they grow is oftentimes inedible. And so you'll find them going to Walmart, Target, uh, to, uh, to go for lunch. I mean, they're eating as unhealthy food as you and I would be coerced into eating as well, uh, living in a kind of an inner city or a kind of an economically depressed urban area. They're no different uh, in that. So this is an important uh, argument. Uh, it's an important data actually to think about the impossibility of land ownership because even people we stereotypically think of as land owning farmers, if they are not growing crops that is edible and instead are growing crops that become, you know, fuel for the car. And instead they're going to like 
little Italian restaurant uh, in the middle of the center, you know, the center of the farm area or, you know, buying uh, whole, you know, basically buying things from Walmart, then the question for us is, you know, what do we do uh, about uh, the absence of land ownership? Can there be food sovereignty if there is no absence, if there is no land ownership? And I think uh, the answer is yes, there can be, I believe. Uh, and the guide for that answer is a much more robust understanding of religion. And I would argue a robust understanding of the capacity of the human body to transform and in transforming to make the spaces around it different than the ways in which they are designed. And I think that's the key part of food sovereignty, which I believe, whereas Alcon doesn't get to that point because of this uh, fixation on land ownership, we start to see that point come through in uh, the second book that we are currently reading, which is Gretel Van Buren's uh, book on environmentalism and, uh, and food and religion. Okay, so how do we get to that point in Gretel's work? In short, the ways in which Gretel van Vieren differs from Alcon is that, well, let's actually point out in what ways they are on the same page. They're on exactly the same page with the critique of the organic movement. They both argue that the organic movement degrades the land, that it, uh, you know, uh, is inhumane. It's, it's also uh, against animals. It is uh, oppressive to cows. It, 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 it is the source of illness. It is, uh, contributes to water and land pollution. It contributes to climate change. It contributes to all sorts of ecological crises. So they are both on the same page in uh, offering a, a, a very damning critique of the organic movement. Where they do differ, however, is that for, while for Alcon, the answer to it is land ownership, and then Alcon looks at various examples of uh, marginalized communities vying for land ownership, including the nation of Islam. And so where religion for Alcon then becomes a kind of a, an example, uh, but uh, you know, a, a kind of a static example, sort of like, hey, look, this is nation of Islam. They have land, they have a farmland, they're doing food justice. Van Viren does something very different. Van Viren says that I will actually focus on religious traditions. And I will focus on their values about the land. I will focus on their practices with the land. And most importantly, and this is a key part, I will focus on their experiences. What kind of feelings do they undergo when they are practicing agriculture? That's the key part for Van Viren. So when I said, when you think about religion, you have to pay attention to the human body what does the human body do? The human body has feelings. And what do feelings do? Feelings have the capacity to transform us. We're not necessarily shifting away from space to body. We're not saying that we're not gonna pay attention to this concept of land and just now pay attention to the body. Instead, what we're saying is that by paying attention to the human body, we can actually have a much more dynamic notion of space as well, where spaces are no more just about inclusion or exclusion. It's no more a story about I have a farm that I own or I'm sitting in a studio apartment building um, in Baltimore and I have ownership of nothing, including my studio apartment building. So it's no more a case of I have land or I don't have land. I am in a good place, I'm in a bad place. I am in the inner city, I am in this beautiful farm. I don't have food justice, I have food justice, right? It's not as simple as owning land or not owning land, but rather it becomes a much more creative exercise of constantly producing space and having a kind of ownership of that space, which is not bound around legal contracts, like I own this land, but more about what the body does in that particular space. So what does that mean for city dwellers? What it means is that, you know, you do not necessarily will have ownership of land ever in the, over the course of your life, but you can still have a sense of ownership, a sense of feeling, a sense of relationship to certain areas, certain spaces, because of the transfor transformation you undergo by practicing agriculture on that particular plot, on the particular area that you are practicing your agriculture in. Because remember, think about city people. 
city people are actually very different than farmers. One could argue one of the key differences is that kind of scale. In cities, spaces are very tight. Uh, you have tight alleys, you have tight streets, um, you have houses one after another, you have your gas station, etc. You don't have much expansive areas in the city. It doesn't feel like you're driving through Texas. It doesn't feel like you're driving through Indiana. Uh, there is traffic congestion. There are street lights. There are uh, subway stations, bus stops, etc. So there's a sense in which cities can be quite constraining. It can be quite. Uh, it can create this feeling of always being uh, uptight, right? And that is oftentimes a source of consternation, but it can also be a charming quality of the city. Um, think about a coffee shop, think about, um, you know, a little bakery at the side of the street, or just think about sitting at the bus stop um, amidst all the noise, amidst all the, the noise of the construction workers drilling the, the ground underneath. Um, there is a certain uh, charm, a certain energy, a certain bustle to the city as well. And as much as city peoples may find that lack of vast swaths of land uh, a kind of a, you know, a, a sign of frustration, it can also be what city people enjoy, what city people are used to. And so why am I talking about this distinction between large, expensive, vast of land versus these tiny alleys, these tiny little plots? Um, let me think about the, you know, the, the stone built apartments in, in Baltimore, these tall angular uh, little homes, three, three floors tall, tiny little uh, studio apartments. What's the point behind all of that? If you follow uh, Van Vieren, and Van Vieren looks at in particular Abrahamic traditions and their understanding of agriculture, what ultimately Van Vieren takes us to is looking at this phenomenon of urban gardens. Van Vieren is not looking at religion as a kind of an ahistoric phenomenon, like let's do Christianity, then let's do Judaism, and then let's do Islam, although she is very interested in those three Abrahamic traditions. Instead, Van Vieren is ultimately looking at these partnerships that religious communities are building with secular entities, and it leads to the creation of these spaces such as a communal urban garden where school children will come and learn how to grow crops. And Van Vieren makes a very important insight, which is that when these children are growing crops on these vacant plots of land in an urban inner city kind of a space, think about like barb grill nearby, like a little basketball court, a little softball ground maybe nearby too, but most probably a little basketball court uh, with, you know, like a lines of apartments and cars going by and traffic lights and bus stop, etc. Think about an urban, very super urban space. You may have a little coffee shop across the street. You may have a bar across the street. You may have a little cinema. You may have a train station, uh, etc. When Viren says that the children undergo a transformation, that when they're growing the crops, they themselves feel differently about the space that they inhabit. And in feeling differently, they learn to think about these spaces differently as well. What does it mean to think about these spaces differently? Well, what it means is all of a sudden the city designed to be segregated starts to feel different than that kind of segregated space, right? Baltimore, for instance, Lawrence Brown in, in his book, The Black Butterfly, and the white L, he argues that Baltimore has this kind of designing where you have a kind of a white neighborhoods that are not very, not horizontally large, but they kind of go up and down vertically, uh, Hopkins up, up above, and then a kind of little to the east. And then he says on both sides of the L, there are these butterflies, East Baltimore, West Baltimore, and that's predominantly African-American, where African-American residents reside. Now that is the way in which city in that particular case is delineated, right? That's the, that is the city, uh, how the city is, uh, is shaped, is how it's designed, uh, thanks to laws like uh, housing laws, restrictive covenants, et cetera. But the question, 
that we need to think about is what would happen if we were to think about these spaces differently? How could these spaces differ? Uh, and what would that difference look like? Especially if we were to orient ourselves around these urban communal gardens. It's gonna show you adding a little lentils here and it's gonna be, we're gonna put it on a boil. I'm gonna put some water in here. Then we're gonna start boiling it. I think one of the answers to the question is that the urban communal garden allows communities that are marginalized and that are constrained within the black butterfly to all of a sudden reimagine and to navigate, to beautify the black butterfly, to make the black butterfly a site of health, a site of uh, a food bank, as opposed to a food desert. Because when you design the city into a white L and the black butterflies, of course, the grocery stores are gonna reinforce that designing. So you're gonna have Trader Joe's and Whole Foods in the white L, but you're gonna have the dollar store and the Giants and the Trader Joe, uh, and the Giants and the, and the and uh, 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 what's the other grocery store uh, uh, called? I'm totally banking, blanking on the name, but you, uh, Safeway. You're gonna have Safeway Giants uh, in, uh, in the black butterfly, but you're gonna have Whole Foods and Trader Joe's in the white L, right? So the distribution of food reinforces the designing of the city into a black L and a white, uh, uh, white L and a black butterfly. But if you're gonna build these communal gardens, all of a sudden, it's gonna start to look a whole lot different. You're gonna still have the design of the city racially segregated, but within that racial segregation, now you have opportunities to remake the black butterfly, to beautify the black butterfly. And all of a sudden, the black butterfly will transform from a place that is a food desert. In other words, everything you eat is unhealthy. There's nothing healthy crops to grow into a food bank. And if you build upon Alcon's point that even the Trader Joe's and the Whole Foods are no different, they just look different, they're just made to present themselves as differently, you start to wonder what exactly is the power of these kinds of urban gardens. I mean, the power of these urban gardens is very much that they can allow African-American Baltimoreans living in the black butterfly to all of us that don't have access to the food that they grow, even against the other Baltimoreans living in the white, in the white L, because now you have access to certain foods that you grow and it's the crop that you are growing. So you may not necessarily have quote unquote ownership of land, but you do have ownership um, uh, in, a, in a more relational sense as opposed to owning in terms of I own this and it is a possession of mine, but more like I own this, it is in a relationship with me. You have a relationship to the land around you. And the land around you is pretty small. I mean, these are the key differences uh, when you think about, uh, you know, a urban garden as opposed to a big farm, an urban garden is oftentimes built on top of a kind of a vacant, uh, abandoned parking lot, for instance. It's a much smaller, uh, you know, um, um, uh, surface area than a big farm. But it raises an important question, is a big farm then key to food sovereignty? Or do we need to build these smaller, much more intimate urban spaces to create food sovereignty. And if you follow Van Viren, she would suggest that in fact, it is these smaller spaces that are key to food sovereignty, that we need to actually disband vast agricultural land use. And we need to make our land use as minimal as possible in order to create food sovereignty. So food sovereignty then rests on these very, very, very urban practices which are not based on land ownership, but rather based on an experience of agriculture, which transforms the body and in the process, transforms the spaces that surround us. All of a sudden, black butterfly is gonna look very differently than it did before. 
And it's not going to look differently because it's going to merge with the white L or it's going to try to assimilate or emulate the white L. That's not why it's going to look differently. It's going to look differently because it's going to practice a kind of agriculture which is experiential, which makes you feel and transform. And this, according to Van Vieren, is the key insights of these Abrahamic religious traditions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. She pays particular attention to these three traditions because they all routinely come under the attack of environmentalists for being for their agricultural practices causing ecological crises. But Verviren says the exact opposite. She says that their agricultural practices can be a lesson and a guide for us on how do we execute and implement food sovereignty in our cities. And the reason for this is because she argues that all of these environmentalists who attack these religions for their agricultural practices tend to assume that environmental health or that land is somehow inherently sacred, that somehow the land's sacrality has nothing to do with the people who live on it. And if anything, the people ruin the land's sacrality by doing these things like cultivating it and irrigating it. And she argues the exact opposite, which is that the land is always in a relationship with the people who live on it, right? And as a consequence, when we think about food sovereignty, we have to pay attention to the people doing the agriculture, not the extent to which they have ownership of land or not. And that is the key point for us. So religion then is that experience of agriculture, which allows you to feel differently and in the process, transform the spaces around you because they are now part of your body your body becomes the space. The body makes the space around you different. You move differently, you kneel differently, you bend differently, you gather differently, you experience time differently. And so these vacant plots of land where you're building these urban gardens, it's not just a little dot on the map. It completely changes the way in which that entire neighborhood's gonna feel. For one, it actually, I think, makes the role of women much more visible because if you think about I don't know how many of you attended that presentation, uh, that uh, conversation with, with, with Lawrence Brown and Siobhan. Siobhan, if you recall, for those who attended, I asked her, what is the role of black motherhood? And I put an image of these African-American women uh, sitting together outside of the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in their urban garden. And she mentioned that, that the work of the black, black church food security very much hinges upon uh, the work these women do, because these women are ultimately the carriers of the seed. Uh, they form these relationships of sisterhood around gathering the seed. And so it makes the role of women much more visible in the city. And that is a key point too. When we pay attention to religion, we have to pay attention to women's practices, because oftentimes things like cooking and eating are historically things that are delegated to women. And the experience of agriculture, therefore, becomes one which is very much led by women. All right, team, so that was the two works. I hope that allowed you to understand in which ways they're similar and they differ. Now, I want to kind of look at the extent to which I can practice food sovereignty by sharing with you this recipe of the dal. Dal is a very uh, prevalent dish in South Asia and Africa as well. It is lentils. And these are basically these things called the red lentils, masoor dal that I purchased from an Indian Pakistani grocery store. You can also find that in various Palestinian grocery stores or Arabic grocery stores and elsewhere, international grocery stores. What I had been doing while I was summarizing the two books and telling you the ways in which they're similar and different is I was cutting, chopping up some ginger. I love fresh ginger. I love the smell of fresh ginger, that zesty smell. So I prefer fresh ginger over ginger powder whenever I can. It's also just fun to cut ginger because it's kind of therapeutic. It, you know, so it takes a little bit of time. I just enjoy cutting ginger. And then another thing I really love is this thing called cilantro. Uh, and I love a lot of cilantro. So I may just keep peeling some more cilantro. Basically you want to cut these little, you know, the little tentacles, you want to take those out, keep the leaves. And it's again, a very arduous, laborious process, but it can be quite therapeutic as well. So I love the cilantro. The cilantro is go, will go on top of the dal when it's all cooked. Uh, so I was doing that to save some time. And after I had been doing that, I put some dal in my little pan or a big pan. And now, as you can see, the water is boiling in the dal. 
And I'm gonna get some turmeric powder, which you can find at any ethnic store as well. They look quite yellowish, yellowy like this. There's some turmeric powder. That, and I will pour turmeric powder over my dal. How much? I'm not a teaspoon kind of a guy. I like, I like to just, just pour. And the more the merrier. I'm not too crazy about measurements. I'll explain to you a little bit more why I do that. Uh, reason for me is I think the most important thing with dal is the fact that you just want to be a little, not too measured. You want it to go on a nice ride with the boiling and everything. I mean, as you can see, my water is boiling, is going up and down, it's going crazy, it's all over the place. I kind of enjoy that experience. And the reason is with dal, the best way to cook dal is you want to put a lot of water over the dal. So if your dal is, and I don't know how much many inches of dal there is, usually you don't need that much dal. If you're just cooking for yourself, you know, I mean, one teaspoon or two teaspoons of dal can be actually enough for just one person, maybe two teaspoons for, for two people. Uh, you don't need too much dal to cook for a lot of people. But no matter how much dal you put, you want to put an exorbitant amount of water. Put a ton of water and then just put it on boil. So you can see, I mean, that boil is quite high. That is medium high, definitely on the higher end of medium high. And my dal is just cooking, right? It's going nuts. It's absolutely just cooking. And that's how I like it. I like it to cook, 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 because ultimately, as it keeps on cooking, by the time the water evaporates and absorbs, your dal is pretty much ready. And then it becomes a question of how soupy you want the dal. Do you want it a soupy dal, a bit of thick dal, or do you want it a more watery dal that is, uh, you know, more, uh, uh, more, uh, what's the word? Uh, just fitter for using with rice. So a lot of people will eat their dal with rice. So if your dal is watery, it, it goes really well with rice. If your dal is soupy, it just goes well by itself. And a bit of a dip of sour cream on top it can also add a nice little texture and flavor to it as well. So there are two kind of different um, uh, styles of dal, but ingredients are the same for me. It just really comes down to how long I let the water boil and it's a difference of maybe a couple of minutes of extra boiling or not. So this one is going to be more soupy uh, because I don't have rice and I'm going to make it a little more soupy as a result. But in either case, the starting point is put a ton of water and just let it boil. Now that it's boiling, I'm just going to lower the heat just a little bit so that the water doesn't uh, slip off behind my back. My recipe of dal, I call it the marinara dal because I have combined this particular pasta syrup called the marinara sauce and needed both hands to, and then I will just put a ton of it. All right. So, I mean, you look at that. I mean, that is just a lot, a ton. I don't know how much that was two teaspoon, three teaspoon, who knows. But I like to go for broke uh, and I'm not crazy about measurements as I already mentioned. So I go crazy with my, uh, I'll just keep it outside for, for teaching purposes. Um, I go crazy with my marinara dal. Now, as you can see, the color is kind of evolved into a more red, kind of a burgundy color, a sort of red and yellow, which is nice. It just looks really nice too. And uh, the water content is quite a lot. I will, again, heat, keep the heat going. I love the heat going. Heat doesn't really ever have to go down. That moment I had to just turn it off a little bit because I didn't want the water to drip behind my back. But, you know, if you have, uh, you don't really necessarily have to bring your heat down. Just let it boil. Uh, it's a fast process. It takes like 10, 15 minutes max. I mean, this is a lot of dal I'm cooking. So I'm cooking for like four or five people. Usually if I just cook for myself, the water will have already evaporated. I would have cooked in a slightly smaller pan as well. But again, the ratio of the dal to the water is massive. Twice the amount of water, maybe even thrice the amount of water 
uh, uh, to uh, to the dal ratio. That's not how I learned how to cook the dal recipe. For my mother, she would always say, you know, you put just a little bit more water than dal, and then you keep calibrating. So if the water starts evaporating, you add more water. If it doesn't evaporate, you keep letting it cook. And I thought, why should I just keep recalibrating over and over again? I'm just going to put a ton of water and just let it boil. And what I found out is the end product, the dal's texture always comes out really nice. I never felt the dal was too dry. And I just always felt like the dal tasted really good. So I just stuck, I just stuck with it. And of course, the marinara is also a kind of a discovery I made because usually what people do is they will cut tomatoes and they'll put pieces of like cubicles of tomato, like, you know, cut tomatoes into quarters and then put like pieces of tomato in there. And I just enjoyed the flavor of the marinara sauce and uh, I really liked it and it went so well. And uh, so I stuck with that. Now, there's no real time that matters. You can put it right away or a little later, but what the heck, let's just do it. I'm gonna put all my ginger in it. I'm using my knife. Pick up the ginger, put all the ginger in there. The ginger gives the dal a, a kick. And uh, ginger is a very healthy uh, thing to eat. It's really good for your stomach. If you ever have a bloating at night after dinner, I highly suggest cutting some ginger pieces or even just using ginger powder, putting some honey and boiling water. So that becomes ginger tea, just like ginger base with honey and water, boiling water, and you just drink some ginger. That becomes the ginger tea, just drink a glass of that and you'll sleep much better. Uh, also just going for a nice little walk after your dinner can be a big difference too, but that's something you can incorporate in your diet as well. I love ginger and everything I eat. So ginger is cooking. Now you can see the dull pieces are coming up. It means the water is boiling. The water is going real hard. The bubbles are coming up. That means the water is absolutely starting to evaporate, which is good. It's just going to do more and more of that. As it's evaporating, now if you like to mince and to cut your garlic, go for it. Garlic makes my fingers smell garlicky for way too long. So I'm not a big fan of cutting garlic. So I'm just going to use a good old garlic powder and uh, I think it is from Trader Joe's or something some some grocery store and look there's a ton of garlic I put in there I like this the taste of garlic so again I am being very liberal with my use of garlic I don't know how many teaspoons there were but it was a lot but it's gonna taste good there's no such thing as I had too much garlic or too much ginger you the if you put more than necessary, you just made your dal a little tastier than it would have been otherwise. That's sort of the principle I go with. So I got the dal, the dal is cooking, it's coming up. The texture is becoming this nice burgundy color, which I love. And as, I, as you remember, I said, I'm gonna make it soupy, which means I'm gonna boil my water just a tad bit longer than I otherwise would have. Uh, so that it's not on the watery side, but on the soupy side. And the reason is just very simple. I'm not using it with rice. Otherwise I would have, uh, 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 done some uh, basmati rice and that would have gone really good with it. So, but I'm gonna make it more soupy. And you just let it boil uh, as it's doing that. Another thing you can do is you can use uh, caraway seeds or uh, this other seed called, uh, totally banking off on the name. I think it's called caraway seed, but uh, cumin seed, sorry, that's what it's called. I don't think I have cumin, but do I? I do have cumin seed here. Yeah. Are we talking about cumin seeds, cumin seeds? I mean, there's all kinds of things. There's this thing called the Amchur powder, dry mango powder, put it in. If you find it, I like that too. It's a lot of fun. And you know what? I'm just gonna do it for the fun of it. Totally uh, not needed, but, uh, but as a nice little kick. Uh, so I'm just gonna add a bit of Amchur. Ooh, that's a lot of Amchur, but it'll be tasty. Dry mango, that's I'm sure you will probably not find it in most grocery stores. You're gonna have to go uh, to a nice Pakistani or Indian grocery store, international maybe to find that. Uh, another optional thing you can add, and this comes in the latter stages is you use cumin seeds. And in order to get the cumins, you will need a pan. 
small little pan like this. And then you will pour some olive oil. And by the way, just as your dal is boiling, just keep, keep using your spoon to just mix, mix it up, making sure that nothing sticks in the bottom. But I just want to show you, I'm just going to make the oil heat up. But keep moving this. This will tell you how much of the dal is coming together. It's going to congeal. It's going to start to feel heavier. You're going to start to feel the dal pieces, uh, you know, uh, their weight against the spoon. It's a good sign. It means the water is boiling and just, just, just keep doing it. Just keep, keep moving it, you know, um, until the water becomes so absorbed and so evaporated that uh, it starts to become more of a soup. See, right now it's still pretty watery. Just keep, keep it go, keep it go. All right, and all right, we got the, the oil is cooking. Now we're just gonna put the cumin seeds. Now, usually you want the oil to be nice and hot because they want the seeds to go right away. You want them to be swimming in your oil and you can see them start to swim already that's a good sign because you don't want the seeds to be in there for too long they're going to start to cook and they're going to burn real fast so it's a very quick process usually this is long enough like five seconds maybe at most and release it and then it's going to make a nice little sound I could have done this process a little later. I could have done it right at the end, but oh well, it doesn't matter. The taste will still be there. So those are my seeds. And now the last thing I will put after the dal has been cooked and the stove is off the fire is the cilantro that I had in there. All right, so we got just putting most, all right, that's a little stuck there. It's okay, we're just gonna wash it off. So just keep moving it, moving it, moving it. So this is an example of a dish that I have kind of like learned how to cook. I was taught, but also I added some of my own uh, innovations to it. It harkens back to the story I told about Sister Clara Muhammad. If you guys recall, she was actually one of the founding members of the Nation of Islam. Um, she doesn't show up in the book in Alcons because for her, food sovereignty really did not have much to do with land ownership. It instead looked a lot similar to those kind of urban gardens that come across in uh, Van Vuren's work. She was a distinctly urban person. She moved from Cordell County, Georgia to Detroit. Uh, she grew up on a farm, but then a uh, daughter of sharecroppers, but then was living in Hastings Street neighborhood of Detroit, uh, a, a neighborhood that was uh, segregated, uh, uh, you know, absorbed most of the African-American migrants coming from the rural South after World War I. And uh, she faced, uh, um, a lot of struggles with food. In fact, you know, there was not much to eat. The grocery stores in the neighborhood, you know, sold all kinds of unhealthy food products. And there was a public market, which is this very important historic space, urban space, um, very big back in the early 20th century where farm product produce would come and be, uh, be sold in this, this big uh, uh, outdoor space. And all the people of the city would come and buy produce it was sort of a forerunner, I would say, to the organic food movement today because it was located in the neighborhoods where the African-American residents could not easily come to. Um, if you are to look at uh, the Eastern Market in Detroit, which was the public market for the city, actually is not too far away from the historic uh, Hastings Street neighborhood, uh, which has been effaced now by the Chrysler Highway and the Ford Football Stadium. But then back in the day when the Hastings Street neighborhood did used to exist, uh, it's just a few blocks away, but I don't find any archival data that suggests that the African-American residents of the Hastings Street neighborhood uh, routinely went to buy stuff from the Eastern market. So my assumption is that even though it was a few blocks away, it was quite similar to the fact that like a lot of these Whole Foods and Trader Joe's are 
technically speaking, maybe half a mile away from where the African-American residents of Baltimore live, but due to segregation, you will rarely see um, a situation where the migrants, the, the, the city's African-American residents are actually consuming food from these public markets. So no data tells me that African-Americans were big time consumers. Uh, instead, it just seems to suggest that the rest of the city was being fed at the public markets. But going back to Clara Muhammad, she does something else, right? She learns this dish called the bean soup. And again, she was giving, uh, given a recipe by Elijah, uh, by Farad Muhammad, who was this guy from uh, India, uh, Pakistan area, the British subcontinent back in the day. And he taught her this recipe of the bean soup. And she and her sisters, they looked for bean, they found out that they could only find uh, navy bean and they were told to find pink bean. But for us that, you know what, navy bean works too. And then they just played with the recipe and became these expert navy bean uh, soup uh, makers. And it became the staple dish of the nation of Islam. And according to the granddaughter Halima Muhammad, it allowed the community to no longer have to beg for food from the city officials also allowed the community to demonstrate a kind of food sovereignty which was more advanced than the public market and why would it be more advanced i think one of the key reasons is that it's an example of how the food is around you you may be a little more still you're sitting in the kitchen you're not moving around you don't have to go get the food the food is getting to you and i think that's a key point when we think about food sovereignty i think the body in most cases of food sovereignty, you're gonna have food around you rather than you chasing the food. So the public market, remember one big location, people from all over the city had to get to the public market, but the navy bean soup was being cooked inside the kitchen of where Clara used to live with her sisters. And it was, it was intimate, it was right there. And kind of intimate the same way that I am being intimate with you right now. I have my Zoom on, I'm in my kitchen, well, it's not my house, but anyways, that's a different story where I am. But I'm in a kitchen right now. I'm inside a house and cooking a dal for you. So very, very, very similar. But in many ways, not necessarily an exemplar of food sovereignty either. In many ways, I'm also struggling to achieve food sovereignty. And we can talk about in what ways that is the case. Okay, so this, this thing is getting a little too hot. I can barely hold it. So I'm gonna find something else to keep moving it. Maybe this guy would be good. All right, get something else, keep moving. All right, now the water is boiling. Boiling a lot, as you can see, the sides have gotten look quite burnt out, but that's okay, they're gonna wash up. Um, but you gotta keep boiling because remember there was so much water in there. Um, the more it boils, the more the soup, will, the, 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 the lentils will have this very mature texture about them. They're not gonna look too dry. They're not gonna look too uh, brittle. They're just gonna look good and they're gonna taste good. So that's my thing with water. The more water and the more water boils, I don't know what it does, but it just hydrates, it conditions the, the, the dal and it just makes the dal taste really good. And effect, essentially we're just gonna keep doing it until the water has fully boiled. And then we're gonna put our cilantro on top. So one way to check is to see how much water drips when you pick it up. I think there's still enough water dripping. This would be good enough if you were to pour it on rice or you know place it next to rice. But uh, what I'm doing is drinking it like a soup. And actually, you know, as a soup too, this is fine. It can be a little watery, but I'm kind of making more like a, more of a kind of a, you know, like a, like a heavier soup rather than a brothy soup. But not that it makes much of a difference. But it is key that you just keep moving it. At the last moment, you just want to make sure you move and move and move and keep the dal moving in there. You don't want it to get stuck underneath. You don't want any pieces of dal to burn on the bottom of the pan. Go, go, go. Maybe do it for two more minutes. Be wary of the 
splashes of oily water. It's not too dangerous uh, because there's not too much oil in there. In fact, there is very little oil. But nevertheless, protect your fingers, be cognizant, be watchful. I'm holding it right up here so it doesn't travel all the way up to my fingers. But as you can see, it does splash out of the pan. So you gotta be just a little watchful. And as you can see, the water is getting mm, a little thicker. I'm gonna make it keep going, keep going, keep going. The pan is getting heavier. The, the, my wrists are getting a little more, like they're working a little harder, which is good. It should get a little heavier. It should feel like you got a lot of dal to move in there. And this is the final stages. So maybe two more minutes really depends on how much water you put in there. Um, but I like a lot of water, so it just keeps boiling. This is much easier to do than having to recalibrate and figure out how much more water to put in, in the middle of it also. This is a change I made from my mother's, my mom's uh, suggestions. Um, So as you can see, the water is thickening, which is a good sign. Every time I leave it, the dal disappears. You see the bubbles coming up. That's a good sign. And then the more, every time I try to mix it, the dal comes on the top. And you just want, however you want it, you can make it a little more soupy, you can make it a little thicker, you can make it more brothy or more soupy. Really depends on how you want to eat it. You want to more drink it or you want to more eat it comes down to you. But for the sake of time, I will stop it at that particular stage. And then what I really do is I just let it cool off a little and I'll add some more cilantro. I'll cut up a little more cilantro and I will eat it. Now, I just wanted to show you the ways in which this particular exercise was an example of food sovereignty and the ways in which it was not necessarily an example of food sovereignty. And I want to show you this little package. This is something that I think I can, we can really get the Alcon's point home, both Alcon and Van Buren. Both of them argue that the organic food movement is as deleterious to your health as the other food you receive elsewhere because you are not producing the food. You're not in charge. You do not know where this food is coming from. Now here's my dal cooling off a little bit. And this is exactly the same dish called the yellow turka dal. Turka means a little, uh, a little splash, a little oily splash. So you usually put a little olive oil on top and it goes psh, Basically, that little like thing I did with the cumin seeds, had I done it right at the end, it would have been a turka. So it's basically, I did the turka too, I just did the turka a little too early. It doesn't make much of a difference. It's effectively, it's the exact same kind of dal. It's the same dish. A savory, creamy, and spicy blend of lentils and spices. Okay. I had this a few days ago, and then I cleaned up the inside because I wanted to keep it to show it to you. And I'll testify my experience with it was really similar to the experience you might have if you were to go eat some chicken uh, to some fish uh, fillet of fish at a McDonald's. It's tasty, it's a lot, there's a lot of taste, but then after a while you start to feel a little heavy, you start to feel a little blo bloaty. And in particular, these little red spices were quite uh, punctuated. I could, I could feel them hit my tongue quite a lot. I didn't feel them being very streamlined, very, and now look at this, look at this little guy. See how it's nice and creamed up. The water is just like drowning, it's just sleeping. It's kind of like sleeping on the, in, the, in the rice. Now the water and the dal is nicely together. Okay, going back to the, this guy. The Trader Joe's dal, I had it, I needed it, I was hungry, I ate it. Many similar ways you would have to eat something that is prepackaged, it serves that purpose, right? But you might be thinking, ooh, this is Trader Joe's. Uh, this is not McDonald's. This is the exact opposite of a filet of fish sandwich.
but my experience of it was that it was very much similar to McDonald's and that Alcon and Van Buren are exactly on point when they say that the organic food makes us think that it's so different, but it's actually not, right? I don't know where this dal was cooked. I don't know who cooked it. I don't know whose recipe it was. I don't know how it was packaged. I don't know how the dal was put inside of it. I don't know how it was kept uh, frozen or how it was made to be edible despite being in a store for so long. I do not know the entire process. This one I do. I just cooked it in front of you. This is my dal. This is my recipe. Um, it was me putting in the spices. It was me cooking it. So those are some of the key differences, right? Where I am shying away from the organic food model. This one I would have had to purchase and I put it in microwave and I put it out. I'm not really producing. This one I am, this is my produce. This was zero, there was nothing in this pan and now there is dal in this pan. And I'm not gonna eat it for you, but I can confirm to you this dal is just a lot better. My dal is really good. This one was a little bloaty. This one is not bloaty. It's a beautiful dal and it's tasty as hell. All right. So let us celebrate that by putting our little cilantro. It's cooled off now. We're going to just nice little cilantro. I love those colors. This is something else I do with my dal. This is not something I found in the Trader Joe's one. So instead of those little red spices that hit my tongue, uh, I'm going to just put some cilantro on top. Adds nice flavor to it and you just Every time you take a bite, you know, you just take a big scoop, put it in your bowl and you got your cilantro in there as well. This is what it ultimately looks like. Scoop of sour cream, great to go. You don't really need it, but that's something I do too. So anyways, why is it, you know, why would you think like this is so different than, uh, than, than McDonald's? Maybe you don't think it's so different than McDonald's. Uh, you know, I'm 30 years old, 31. And I recall when I was seven and McDonald's was a new thing in Pakistan. McDonald's was hip. I mean, people went crazy over McDonald's. I mean, if you took someone out on a date to McDonald's, that was a big deal. That was like a very serious date. Um, and so was Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut was this very delicate uh, uh, shop. I mean, a big restaurant. I mean, two floors where the waiter, a waiter would come and take your order. So back then, I mean, these fast food restaurants were hip. They were very fancy. And even to this day, I mean, if you look at the packaging of a McDonald's filet of fish, I mean, it's still packaged with very catchy aesthetics with the font, with the colors. And we might have grown old enough and seen McDonald's evolve to the point where we associated with poor people's food. And we associate the packaging of McDonald's or those little like plastic cardboard things in which the burgers are placed as like things you see next to the trash can or etc. And we might say this is like fancy stuff, but really uh, not so much different. It's got fancy colors. You can see those like South Asian horse calligraphies are very kind of like Indian, Indian kind of like uh, drawings. You know, you got the yellow doll, you got a little yellow background, nice colors, very vibrant colors. And it looks so nice, right? It has that nice feel to it. But, you know, McDonald's would argue that it's filler fish packaging has a very nice feel to it as well. Um, and I would say, yeah, they're both really, the aftertaste is the feeling on the stomach is very similar, very heavy. Uh, you do feel like you ate some processed food. This is gonna feel differently. Now you might ask, but Cher, you showed me a lot of things that you bought from the grocery store as well. So to what extent are you really that different? Good point. So this is one of the things I used, right? Rouse homemade marinara sauce. And I picked the Rouse one, it was $7.99. There was another one from Prego, which was about $2.99. The reason I picked the Rouse is because for the Rao one, the sugar content was four grams, where for the Prego, the sugar was six grams. Nevertheless, even with the Rao one, $5 more expensive, the most expensive marinara sauce at the grocery store, four grams of sugar, that's unnecessary, right? That four grams of sugar is happening because that sugary taste is something tomatoes usually have. If you are to like actually grow tomatoes in, in your home, it's gonna taste like a fruit. It doesn't taste like tomatoes. It tastes really, really sweet. It's like the most tastiest thing, just like pet, plucking a tomato and eating it. So a homemade tomato sauce would never need all this sugar. All this sugar is added sugar to make the tomato tastes like a real tomato when in fact it is not right it's a preservative tomato so that sugar is completely unnecessary but I wanted to 
get as few sugar grams as possible. If I had less money in my pockets, I would have probably had to be dependent on the Prego one. I would have saved that $5 and gone for six grams of sugar, right? So yeah, in that way, I have not necessarily reached food sovereignty because I did not grow and pluck my own tomatoes. Had I done that, I would have been one step closer to food sovereignty. And lastly, I would say just having relationships, a kind of communal relationships would have been another key element of food sovereignty, right? So this is key. When you think about food sovereignty, you have to think about bodies. You have to think about the bodies undergoing a transformation when they're practicing agriculture. And when they undergo these transformations, they start to form relationships to one another. The feelings become contagious that spread from one body to another. And when you form these relationships, the space around you becomes different, right? So an urban communal garden can very well represent an, an exemplify food sovereignty because although it is so distinctly urban and although the example is very much not a case of a big farmland, it does allow people to form a sense of relationship. And Van Vieren argues it in fact is what we need moving forward. We do not need vast amount of land. We need the kind of very urban, very, very, uh, very intimate uh, kind of spaces uh, that make women's roles in the city much more visible and so it's very dis very deeply feminine it's very deeply urban and it is something that happens in places as mundane as a vacant parking lot that has been converted into a, a garden so i hope you really enjoyed this class i did over zoom it has been a long class i hope you were able to stay patient uh, i hope you didn't mind the production which was a little up and down but I tried to interlace a lecture with a recipe and I would be really happy to hear your feedback on how the experience went for you as a student listening in. Uh, so do share those feedbacks with me under the comments on the Canvas announcement page. I will send you the link for this video uh, shortly. Peace out, bye-bye.